Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. I'm MC Owens, and this is another special last Friday of the month visual presentation on something Buddhist. And this time it's a, a, a reprisal, it's a repeat of our Dharma Bombs, Buddhism and the Beats, a history of Buddhism in America, presented by me, MC Owens. This is a this is a talk, boy. This is a talk I've been given for a very long time. Um, actually, I went back and looked. Two thousand and five was the first time I gave this this talk. It was a little different back then because I was trying to cram in a lot of different talks that I now give separately. Uh, that at some point I might reference. Um, uh, but in particular, the version that we're about to, to check out now in a second is a, a very special edition of this talk that I put together for the San Francisco Dharma Collective and gave this talk uh, over a year, less than two years ago, but uh, over a year ago uh, at the location uh, on uh, Folsom Street. And um, of course, those were back in the days before we recorded, before uh, we were in Zooming land. Um, and so how this version of this talk is special is that it, it kind of centers on the unique place that San Francisco holds in the history of Buddhism in America, that it has a very special place. Um, and so I kind of made this version of this talk to highlight the, the unique uh, uh, the unique place that San Francisco holds. So uh, off we go uh, into, this of course is a sort of an interesting talk about the history of Buddhism in America that it sort of is, it's not entirely about the beats and the beat generation. So if you've shown up just for that, I apologize. We're not gonna just read from on the road all night, um, but I am using the beats and the beat generation in that moment as sort of this axial moment in time to look at Buddhism sort of before coming to America and after and using again the beats as these axial moment of when sort of Buddhism rose to popularity in America. And so we're gonna definitely be looking at Jack Kerouac's famous uh, book called the Dharma Bums, which is where I, the title of this talk comes from. But I also wanna point out three sources real quick that I, that this talk is basically a summary of uh, this collection, Big Sky Mind, this book, The Awakening of the West by Stephen Batchelor, and this book, How the Swans Came to the Lake by Rick Fields. These three books, pretty much everything I'm about to say coming somewhere from these three books with my own unique twist as far as what I choose to highlight, what I've chosen to put next to the next thing, curation, right, juxtaposition. Uh, and so through that juxtaposition, that curation of information, I'm going to be leaving a lot out. I apologize for all of the information I'm leaving out. Um, but again, I'm kind of choosing and selecting pieces of information that I think are very interesting in particular as it pertains to San Francisco. So those are sort of sources really quickly. Let's get into the beats, right? So this is the our premier beat. Uh, I believe he coined the term. This is Jack Kerouac, author, poet, wanderer, lover of life, lover of many things. Um, there, most of the people here, I try to give their dates. Uh, so you get a time reference that we're talking about here. Um, and of course, Jack Kerouac um, is sort of the, considered sort of the, the leader, or again, at least the coin the phrase for this beat generation and this group of individuals. And this movement, the beats and the beat generation is said to sort of originated, or at least again, a, a moment in history that people latch onto is October, 1955. 3119 uh, Fillmore Street in San Francisco. This was a gallery where Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, a bunch of other poets uh, gave, recited poems. 
And it was kind of one of these um, happenings, you know, as they're called. And so this moment, the Sixth Gallery, that was the place that used to be at 3119 Fillmore. The Sixth Gallery, they had an event, the reading, it was the reading of these great poems by Kerouac and Ginsburg in particular, um, that again is sort of considered the, the beginning of this beat movement. This is Jack Kerouac in all his glory. Um, but one of the things that I wanna point out about Kerouac, oh, and these are the beats at City Lights Books, that's a 261 Columbus, in case you wanna do uh, go check it out. Um, this is an image, I think this is Kerouac, Neil Cassidy, who's sort of a muse, like Jack Kerouac's, like he just thought Neil Cassidy was like the be all, the end all. Um, Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Fern Linghetti at the end. I'm not sure who the other guy is. I've never really known who that guy is. I'm sure somebody knows. Um, but anyways, these are the beats or at least the core group of the beats. And City Lights Books, which still exists at 261 Columbus is sort of, uh, you know, a central piece of San Francisco history. And I wanted to just make this kind of geographical uh, connection with um, that group, that, that bookstore and the whole ethos of that bookstore kind of comes out of this generation. But back to the books, this is Jack Kerouac's uh, famous book On the Road, which was published in 1957. The thing about this book though, is that it's very interesting to know that a, most of it took place in the 40s. So right after the war, 1947, 48, 49, this is uh, kind of Ker Kerouac's quasi autobiographical novel about his travels around the country right after the war. Very, very interesting. And the reason why I make such a, a point about the years is that, you know, like many great authors, it took a while for him to get his great, you know, first book published. And so we tend to think that the ideas in On the Road and Jack Kerouac and all this, we tend to put him kind of closer to the, the hippie generation in the 60s and the summer of love. And like, I think in the popular imagination, the Beats and Kerouac are a little closer to that revolutionary period, the mid to late 60s. But actually the events that, sort of he was describing, again, were from the 40s. And I think that's very interesting, especially when I read this part of On the Road. So this, this part that I want to read is, as a young scholar of Buddhism, I'm in college, I'm in my 20s. And when I came across this, and in particular, when I realized that he had written this in 19, probably 48 or something, I, I was really surprised. So here's, um, oh, and by the way, this is uh, a interesting image of uh, Kerouac holding up the entire, the entirety of On the Road that he wrote out as a scroll. And you might wonder like, well, why did he, why did he do that? And he, he, he says that he considers On the Road a sutra, like a Buddhist text. And so again, like very interesting for, for something coming out of the 40s. And so again, I just wanna read this sort of, um, this quote of his, uh, this is a little lengthy quote. And if you're not familiar with Kerouac, well, I hope to do the, the, the rhythm and the poetry of this justice, but I also hope to do the ideas in it justice. So again, this is from On the Road, published in 57, but again, probably from at least 10 years earlier. So he writes, and for just a moment, I had reached the point of ecstasy that I had always wanted to reach, which was the complete step across chronological time into the timeless shadows and wonderment in the bleakness of the mortal realm and the sensation of death kicking at my heels to move on with a phantom dogging its own heels and myself hurrying to the plank where all the angels dove off and flew into the holy void of uncreated emptiness, the potent and inconceivable radiances shining in bright mind essence, innumerable lotus lands falling open in the magic moth swarm of heaven, 
I could hear an indescribable seething roar, which wasn't in my ear, but everywhere and had nothing to do with sounds. I realized that I had died and been reborn numberless times, but just didn't remember it especially because the transitions from life to death and back to life are so ghostly easy and a magical action for naught, like falling asleep and waking up again a million times, the utter casualness and deep ignorance of it all. I realized it was only because of the stability of the intrinsic mind that these ripples of birth and death took place like the action of wind on a sheet of pure, serene, mirror-like water. I felt myself swinging, I felt sweet swinging bliss, like a big shot of heroin in the mainline vein, like a gulp of wine late in the afternoon and it makes you shudder. My feet tingled. I thought I was going to die the very next moment, but I didn't die and walked four miles and picked up 10 long butts and took them back to Mary Lou's hotel room and poured, them, poured their tobacco in my old pipe and lit up. I was too young to know what had happened. In the window, I smelled all the food of San Francisco. So that's just a tiny little fraction of this amazing book on the road that, you know, it's, he, it's written in this classic Kerouac, you know, periods are few and far between, you know, and it just kind of rolls along. But again, there's a lot of really profound, deep ideas in there that, you know, are clearly Buddhist inspired. He was essentially a Buddhist at the time, or at least he called himself one. And so when I read this as a young scholar of Buddhism, I got really into learning more about like, what was this guy reading? What, what had gotten into his mind in 1947 that he was coming up with this kind of ideas? And to the degree to which it's more than a novel, to the degree to which it's more than fiction and an actual like uh, awakening, uh, an actual moment of awakening where he's describing having realized his own death and rebirth process Wow. Uh, wow. So this is where we begin. This is where the talk tonight kind of begins with this beautiful piece from On the Road. But the talk for tonight is about the Dharma bombs. And this is a book that Kerouac wrote uh, kind of, a, I know, to the degree that I'm, uh, I know anything about Kerouac, I know that a lot of his books, he wrote them sort of at the same time as other ones or pieces of them. And so it's kind of hard to get an exact chronology. Of course, the publication, the Dharma Bums came after this. And this is now we're going to read from the Dharma Bums. Slightly older, by how many years, we're not sure, but a slightly older Kerouac. But he's reflecting, actually. This, the Dharma Bums is written much more in the past tense, where he's reflecting on the time. And so he writes in the Dharma Bums now. I really believed in the reality of charity and kindness and humility and zeal and neutral tranquility and wisdom and ecstasy. And I believed that I was an old time bhikkhu in modern clothes, wandering the world, usually the immense triangular arc of New York to Mexico City to San Francisco in order to turn the wheel of the true meaning or Dharma and gain merit for myself as a future Buddha and as a future hero in paradise. Right. I had not met Jaffe Ryder yet. I was about to the next week or heard anything about Dharma bums. Although at the time I was a perfect Dharma bum myself and considered myself a religious wanderer. So th th those two lines or those two sentences, I think, really en encapsulate Kerouac's Buddhism. And I would put Kerouac's Buddhism with that kind of transcendentalist, kind of rugged individualism. You know, here he is extolling the virtues of like wandering the earth. He kind of sneaks in the paramitas there about ecstasy and wisdom and those things. 
And so the Dharma Buns is a you know beautiful um, again quasi autobiographical novel, but really. Kerouac talking about his own understanding of Buddhism, what he thought Buddhism was, you know, what it meant to be a, 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 a Buddhist at that time. And he's getting a lot of his Buddhism and a lot of, of his information about Buddhism from this character, Jaffe Ryder, who is actually, of course, in, in our reality here, Gary Snyder. Gary Snyder, who was born in San Francisco, 1930, he goes to Berkeley, studies East Asian languages and culture. Um, he's an author, poet, translator. So this is a character in the Dharma Bums, a uh, Jaffe writer, but he's a real guy. And he's still alive today, poet. Um, and I think he's an interesting character, both in the book and in reality, uh, because of his um, early early fixation with Buddhism or his early fascination with Buddhism. So this is also from the Dharma bombs. This is Kerouac writing about Jaffe Ryder or Gary Snyder uh, toward the campus of the university of California. That's Berkeley uh, be not behind another big old house on a quiet street. Hil Hilgis Jaffe lived in his own shack, which was infinitely smaller than ours about 12 by 12 with nothing in it but typical Jaffe appearances that showed his belief in the simple monastic life. No chairs at all, not even one sentimental rocking chair, but just straw mats. In the corner was his famous rucksack with cleaned up pots and pans all fitting into one another in a compact unit and all tied and put away inside a knotted up blue bandana. Then his Japanese wooden pata shoes, which he never used, and a pair of black inside pata socks to pat around softly in his, to pat around softly in over his pretty straw mats. Just room for your four toes on one side and your big toe on the other. He had a slew of orange crates all filled with beautifully, beautiful scholarly books, some of them in oriental languages, all the great sutras, comments on the sutras, the complete works of DT Suzuki, and a fine quadruple volume edition of Japanese haiku. <laughs> so there, of course, you get a little bit of, I guess what would be called the Orientalism of the beats where they sort of really, you know, they really romanticize the East as, you know, that was kind of a thing at, at, in, at the time in the fifties and the sixties. And, you know, again, Kerouac is really idolizing Jaffe Ryder or Gary Snyder as a kind of real Buddhist in that way, living the real Buddhist life. Again, this is Gary Snyder. And you'll see next to him, those are those orange crates, you know, black and white photo, but those are those orange crates filled with all those, the DT Suzuki and the sutras and the comments on the sutras, right? Um, and of course, Gary Snyder definitely considered one of the beats in that way. But also famous in the book is Allen Ginsberg, who in the book Dharma Bombs appears as Alva Goldbrook. <laughs> um, Allen Ginsberg, also a poet, writer, uh, pretty famous Buddhist. Uh, Allen Ginsberg is interesting because rather than the more Japanese, uh, particularly the Zen style of Buddhism that Gary Snyder was into, Allen Ginsberg found himself more following into the Tibetan style of Buddhism. I'm gonna talk about it in a little bit, but this sort of was, um, well, I think it deeply influenced, it, influenced his participation in the, um, in the protest movement of the 60s. You see him here, he, he kind of was involved in a lot of the early, very early kind of free Tibet movement. Um, so just wanna point him out. Again, we're gonna come back to him, but another uh, part of the Dharma Bums, both the book and the movement. And just to kind of wrap those guys up, Kerouac, Ginsburg, Gary Snyder, this is Kerouac's description of the Dharma Bums. See, the whole thing is a world full of rucksack wanderers, Dharma Bums refusing to subscribe to the general demand that they consume production and therefore have to work for the privilege of consuming. 
all that crap they didn't really want anyway, such as refrigerators, TV sets, cars, at least new fancy cars, certain hair oils and deodorants, and general junk that you finally always see a week later in the garbage anyway. All of them imprisoned in a system of work, produce, consume, work, produce, consume. I, I think that pretty much summarizes a lot about, um, you know, a lot about the book, The Dharma Bombs, a lot about the beat movement, the kind of anti-capitalist, anti-consumerist wave that was rising in the 50s with the kind of, you know, uh, just that, that whole world that was coming along, TVs and all. So this is very much against that. The beats were, were kind of against that, that mainstream society. And so interesting that, that at least Kerouac, Gary Snyder, Al, Allen Ginsberg identified Buddhism as a tradition that aligned and identified with their, whether their, it was their protest movement, their anti-capitalism, anti-consumerism, or what have you. So I just want to point out that for these sort of early uh, uh, popularizers, not quite spokespersons yet in that sense, but popularizers of Buddhism, this was the type of Buddhism that they had in mind, right? Something that fit this bill. These are a few of Jack Kerouac's more Buddhist specific works. Uh, he did a retelling of the life story of the Buddha uh, that was uh, serialized, I, th I think at some point and then published, that's called Wake Up. Uh, they, uh, he did his own sutra called the scripture of the golden eternity, which is a uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, care piece of Kerouacian, Kerouacianisms. And, uh, there's a great book, a big fat book called some of the Dharma, which is actually a posthumous publication of all of Kerouac's, um, uh, voluminous notes and kind of formula things that he was maybe going to write all his writings about Buddhism and Dharma. So those are some good sources there. But I wanna introduce you really quick to this guy, Dwight Goddard. Now he's not a beat. You'll see he's actually a little bit before the beat generation, but the reason why you wanna know about him if you've come to this class is that for me, I became very, when I read that part, that piece from On the Road, when I read Dharma Bums, when I learned about these early Buddhists in America, I really wanted to know how did they get into Buddhism? <laughs> if, if, if I'm getting into Buddhism because of these guys, what got them into Buddhism, right? So I kind of became interested in a kind of genealogy of Buddhism in America. And one of the things that, or one of the books, I should say, that was essential for the Beats and that post-war early American Buddhist audience, the book that was really essential was edited by, compiled by this guy, Dwight Goddard, who was a Christian missionary. He went to China and Japan in the 20s, and he put together this thing called a Buddhist Bible. The, the version that you see here on the right is a, a you know, it has a, a new foreword by Robert Aiken, uh, but it's a modern version, but this is a very old book published in the 30s. And this guy, Dwight uh, Goddard, he lived in Santa Barbara, in, at least in the 30s, and he formed one of the first sort of like um, uh, American lay sanghas. It was just a group of people totally interested in Buddhism, getting together, reading what little things they could find. And, and Goddard, Dwight Goddard, finally put together a compilation of all of the things that his, the followers of the Buddha were using. And this was like in Kerouac's back pocket. He, the, the Buddhist Goddard, the Goddard Bible, they would just call it. It was the Goddard Bible, but it was this collection of Buddhist sutras, in particular, William Gimmel's um, 1912 translation of the Diamond Sutra. It is kind of, one, it's not Gimmel that actually, who called it the Diamond Sutra first. There's an earlier version that calls it the Diamond Sutra, but, but this is like a fundamental Sutra, not only for the history of Buddhism, for, but for Buddhism in America, because Kerouac, Gary Snyder, 
Allen Ginsberg, all these guys were really interested in this particular sutra, the 1912 translation found in the Goddard Bible. But wait, there's more. I also want to tell you about this guy, Hermann Constantine Wetterling. Uh, those are his dates. So he converted, converted to Buddhism in 1884 and founded the Buddhist Ray. This is a, a, the uh, cover of it, which was a journal. This was in Santa Cruz, California. So not too far from Santa Barbara, not too far from San Francisco. Uh, he started this journal in 1887 Call, it's considered the first Buddhist journal in the United States. And it was also kind of like the Goddard Bible where uh, this guy, Herman Vetterling went around and, and whatever article or a little translation of something he could find, he would photo, or I don't know how he copied it, but he would copy it and then put together this journal. So I want to read to you a great little piece. So remember, now we're in the we're getting into the the 19th century here now, right? And so this is uh, actually written by Vetterling in the journal where he says, "A subscriber has asked us to publish the Buddhist creed. We are extremely happy to say that Buddhism has no creed. His Majesty the Devil would long ago have swallowed Buddhism." had it had a creed. He has thus far swallowed all organizations with creeds, boards of control and directors, anointed or unanointed. And because of their presence in his belly, he is now noisomely flatulent in this world. <laughs> As seen and heard in the pulpit and in the religious press, dear subscriber, Buddhism has come west not to tickle surfeited palates with old church and new church hash, but to teach men to think righteously and to act righteously, that they may become spiritual free men. <laughs> so once again, we, we kind of get this sort of rugged individual spirit, this American, you know, especially West Coast, rugged individual American spirit that seems to have gravitated onto to Buddhism and been very excited at this idea that it was a religion that's not a religion. It's a religion that has no creed, right? So if you, know, if you didn't know about the Buddhist Ray, fascinating piece of history. This, this of course, although that was uh, a Buddhist specific journal, while we're talking about journals, we need to jump really quickly to the East Coast. We gotta jump over to Massachusetts also kind of mid 19th century now, this is Ralph Waldo Emerson. So now we're back in the transcendentalist days. But the reason why I take us all the way back there is to just stop for a minute at his journal. So on the East Coast, Emerson had his own journal. Now, not a Buddhist journal, it was a literary journal it's called The Dial. But something interesting happened in Emerson's journal, The Dial which was in, I think it was 1844. Henry David Thoreau, also a transcendentalist. So this is so complicated, right? The transcendentalist author, writer, Henry David Thoreau published an English version of a portion of the Lotus Sutra, this Buddhist text in the dial, Emerson's journal but it was translated from a French version of a, a French trans, uh, translation of the Sanskrit by this woman, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, who, as I understand it, was basically the secretary for the dial, the journal. So she knew French, could translate French. They got a hold of a, San, a French translation of the Sanskrit version of the Lotus Sutra, but just part of it. She translates it gives it to Henry David Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau gives it to Emerson who publishes it in The Dial. And this is the first translation of a Buddhist text in English done by Elizabeth Peabody, uh, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. So interesting, another piece of uh, interesting Buddhist history there. This is Henry David Thoreau, aforementioned author and writer there, famous for having written Walden, 
um, you know, he's famous for having sort of dropped out of society a little bit, kind of sort of um, went and lived on Walden, wrote his book. And now that we're so deep in the, in the 19th century, 1854, I mean, we're pretty much right in the middle of the 19th century. I want to read to you a little bit from Walden now to give you a, a flavor for how Buddhism, or at least a certain type of Buddhism was understood by guys like Henry David Thoreau. So he writes in Walden, sometimes in a summer morning, having taken my accustomed bath, I sat in my sunny doorway from sunrise till noon, wrapped in reverie amidst the pines and hickories and sumacs in undisturbed solitude and stillness while the birds sang around or flitted noiseless through the house until by the sun falling in my west window or the noise of some traveler's wagon on the distant highway, I was reminded of the lapse of time I grew in those seasons like corn in the night, and they were far better than the work of the hands would have been. They were not times subtracted from my life, but so much over and above my usual allowance. I realized what the Orientals mean by contemplation and the forsaking of works. So I find this little bit of Walden totally fascinating. Um, again, to the degree to which this is true, rather than just autobiographical fiction in that sense, interesting that he notes, just like Kerouac noted in the quote that I gave you from On the Road, the lapse of time, right? That Kerouac, he said he, it's, he reached the ecstasy that he'd always dreamed of, which was the complete crossing over of chronological time. I, I, more or less, that was his quote. And here, this sort of, the, this uh, uh, Thoreau losing himself until he's reminded of the passing of time. So very interesting there, these sort of early uh, Americans, maybe with their Protestant work ethic, it definitely sounds like uh, Thoreau here has the Protestant work ethic that to be idle, right? Idle, idleness is, you know, is for the devil in that way. And so productivity and hard work, never stopping, go, go, go. That's a God like somebody that goes, goes, goes. And so this sort of moment of stillness that Thoreau or even Kerouac finds himself in, very interesting. Wall so now I'm going to bring us back to the to the West Coast, back to San Francisco. So while while Thoreau's on Walden Pond, slipping into the timeless right after his morning bath, just about the same year, a few years later, in 1857, the first Buddhist temple opens in San Francisco. Now, was it Taoist? Was it Buddhist? Was it just a Chinese temple? It's not really sure because I have yet to find where it is or any more kind of real historical um, information about that first temple. But Chinatown in San Francisco does seem to be, have been the hub and the epicenter of this uh, Buddhism coming from East Asia to the West Coast. And so really quickly, just because it may be that you're not familiar with how all of this happened, I just wanna give you a quick summary of the last 2,500 years of history. It's so, and so that we might have a better sense of exactly what the beats were being exposed to and why, right? So this is my map, this is my timeline. There's a much longer talk I do called the Tender, uh, From 10 Directions. That's this whole talk on how Buddhism spread out of India. But basically, if you didn't know, fifth century BC or so, Buddhism starts in India spreads out as we move along through time, starts to grow in all kinds of ways, north, south, east, and west, is eventually sort of unified as this sort of national religious tradition of India. This is under Ashoka. 
Buddhism spreads to Nepal, down to Sri Lanka, over into what is today Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it's this sort of Northern Indian type of Buddhism that spread to Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's the type of Buddhism that goes to China. In case you didn't know how Buddhism got to China, this is when it happened and this is from, from where it happened, right? That spreads, you know, wild. Chinese go wild for Buddhism, wild for things Indian at this time. And by the year 300 or so, by the third or fourth century, China has really made Buddhism their own, right? It's around this same, same time that another type of Buddhism that went to Sri Lanka is spreading to Southeast Asia. That's that kind of more saffron color there on your map. Eventually, Buddhism spreads to China and Viet, or sorry, the Koreas in Vietnam, but that's via China. And it's important just to note that Vietnamese Buddhism and Korean Buddhism is from China, not from Southeast Asia. And it's from Korea that Buddhism goes to Japan. You can see from the timeline, it doesn't get to Japan until about a thousand years after the Buddha. So just so you know your timeline, Japanese Buddhism is a very old uh, addition, right? But not as old as Tibetan Buddhism, which doesn't really get going until about the sixth century or so, seventh century. After six, after a thousand years, after you know being in China for so long, Chinese Buddhism starts to become its own thing. Things that we never saw in India, things we never saw in Southeast Asia, things we never saw in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Things keep getting wild. And one of these new types of Chinese Buddhism, one of these kind of varieties, eventually all of this new variety that goes to Japan, but one of these new varieties is a thing called Zen Buddhism. And I just want you to see on the timeline and on the map, there are these little pockets of what would be called Zen Buddhism that begin in China. Pretty, again, a pretty late player. This is what the Buddhist world looked like in the you know, 10th century or so. Eventually that Zen type of Buddhism becomes the dominant type of Buddhism in China. And that's eventually what translates, sorry, that's eventually what will translate to Japan. It's also around this time that Buddhism sort of starts to die out in Afghanistan, starts to die out in Pakistan, and it eventually even dies out in India. This is for a bunch of historical reasons that are in my other talk, but I just want you to see now, this is more what the, the world, the Buddhist world looked like at towards the middle of the ninth, 10th century. This Zen thing goes wild. The Japanese go wild for Zen Buddhism. The Vietnamese go wild for Zen Buddhism. And so right here you can see, oh, this is why Zen Buddhism is so popular because there was a moment where that was kind of the be all the end all of East Asian Buddhism. And just from this map right here, I wanna show you, there's kind of, um, I'm gonna advance in time really quickly, get us up to our modern, what's called the common era here. Even though this Zen thing became very popular, there began even more in different types of East Asian Buddhism. But eventually if we move ahead, sorry for the quick uh, timeline here, I just wanna get to this. That historical breakdown was just to get you to that in the 19th century, Henry David throws on Walden Pond, the first Buddhist temples being opened in, in, in San Francisco. And from whence Buddhism came, from the East, from the Orient, there were basically in the 19th century, four types of Buddhism. A type of Tibetan Buddhism that for a long pe time people called Lamism, because of this devotion to Lamas, like the Dalai Lama. So Lamas were these great teachers. And that type of Tibetan Buddhism that's very devotional towards teachers and lamas, that is one type of Buddhism. The type of Buddhism that survived in China after Zen sort of even died out in China is a more devotional type of Buddhism that early researchers of Buddhism, they called it the cult of Buddha, the cult of Fu. Fu is the Chinese word for Buddha modern scholars or modern texts would call this Pure Land Buddhism. 
down in Southeast Asia, there's the kind of uh, more monastic tradition that people are kind of used to. That's the Theravada tradition. And our Zen tradition that began around the 700s or 800s, that's still kind of very, at, at least in the 19th century as well, still very popular in Vietnam and Japan and Korea. So these are the four sort of kinds of Buddhism. There were many more kinds of Buddhisms that are represented by the rainbow at the top of the timeline there. But these are the four types of Buddhisms that, that came to America. Okay. And we haven't mentioned yet that Southeast Asian Theravada. We've, I've talked about the Zen a little bit with Gary Snyder. Uh, I talked a little bit about Tibetan Buddhism with Allen Ginsberg. Talked a little bit about general kind of uh, cult of Buddhism with, with Jack Kerouac, sort of. But we didn't really talk yet about this Theravada tradition. So to, to find out more about that Southeast Asian tradition, we got to go back to this guy, Thomas uh, Rice Davids. He sort of founded the British Polytech Society. This was an academic scholarly group. So these were not practitioners, but they were very interested in early Buddhism. And they found on the right of the screen, you'll see these, uh, it's a photo, uh, um, a Xerox of these palm leaves, kind of uh, palm leaves, like bark. And on them is written, well, the language is Sinhalese, but what the Sinhalese is phonetically of is the Pali language. So it's not the Pali script, there is no Pali script, but the Pali language is represented in these ancient palm leaves. And Thomas Rice Davids and the British Polytech Society, they got busy translating these early Theravada Buddhist texts. And this is very interesting, that Southeast Asian tradition. And this is a fun part of the story. I want to introduce you really quickly to uh, Helen Madame Blavatsky and Henry the Colonel Steele Olcott. These two are very interesting. She's a Russian born mystic, spiritualist, 19th century. Um, she got around, she traveled all around East Coast, uh, Tibet, everywhere. She's very interesting. She was into all kinds of things, spiritually speaking. Henry Steele Olcott was actually the colonel, as he was called, was like um, uh, ex-U.S. Uh, military, <laughs> ex-U.S. Navy. And so the two of them got together and started sort of traveling around and, you know, uh, investigating spiritualism going on around the world. They get together with this guy, Alistair Crowley, the so-called evil the evilest man in the world or something he was also um ex-british military i believe um he started going around the world too east coast west coast everywhere also studying ancient traditions mystical traditions magical traditions you name it the reason why i bring that up them up and, and this is almost a departure from our talk almost because it, it, there's no place for 19th century spiritualism in this talk that's like a whole other talk but here's the thing in 1875 also right 19th century this this group here they begin found start the theosophical society What's interesting about the Theosophical Society is that this was kind of a quasi, they weren't, they were some like kind of academics, but they were practitioners. They were deep practitioners. They were really, really interested in, you know, you name it. Um, again, all kinds of traditions. So they, and in particular, Madame Blavatsky and the Colonel Alcott, they went down to Sri Lanka and in 1880, Madame Blavatsky and the Colonel Olcott became the, the first Westerners to convert to Buddhism. They got ordained 
And this photograph is at their ordination ceremony in Sri Lanka. I believe it was called Ceylon at the time. Um, but fascinating that these two would be the first Westerners and Olcott, American, probably the first American to officially convert to Buddhism. Interesting. Now, they, of course, go to Sri Lanka because that's where the Buddhism is. That's where the Theravada, Thai, uh, the Sri Lankan Thai tradition, or Sri Lankan Theravadan tradition survived. They eventually set up a ashram in India. That, that is a theosophical society ashram. And I, again, I wouldn't even mention Krishnamurti, but he's, he's so integral to this mini part of my story. The Theosophical Society, Aleister Crowley, the Colonel, and the Madam, they seem, and there's books about this, some really great books about the, the formation of the Theosophical Society, but they seem to have gotten it in their head that it would be a really, really interesting idea to create a savior for mankind. And so they found a young um, uh, orphan, no family. He was hanging around the ashram named Krishnamurti, very young boy hanging around the Theosophical Society ashram and the Theosophical Society kind of uh, adopted him. I don't know exactly what, you know, was going on in terms of adoption and orphans in India in the 19th century, but they started training Krishnamurti to be the savior of mankind because the Theosophical Society, they thought that they had figured it all out. They had traveled the globe, they had gotten all the information they had gotten ordained in the Theravada Buddhist tradition, and now they were going to, you know, I'll, I'll use my terms carefully, teach, they were going to teach this young boy all the wisdom so that he could grow up. And he was declared to be Maitreya, the future Buddha in 1909, officially here to save us. <laughs> Now, of course, this is a beautiful story where Krishnamurti, Murtri, he eventually says, I, I don't think I'm the savior you're looking for. He had eventually sort of says, I'm not Maitreya. But he was taught all this spiritual information since birth. And so he, in his own right, became a great spiritual teacher. And then that splits off to a whole other talk. Right now, just as we get to the kind of end of the 19th century portion of our talk, this is a very his, a important historical moment. This is the famous World Parliament of Religions that happened in Chicago in 1893. This is one of those events that's really like, well, it's indicative of a lot of things. It's... Um, well, you know, it's indicative of a lot of things in terms of like travel that was possible. Let me say that again, travel that was previously impossible until the 19th century where that representatives from all the world's religions, Africa, East Asia, Southeast Asia, everywhere came to Chicago in 1893 for this kind of show and tell <laughs> this it was kind of a beautiful idea and so again it's indicative it's indicative of a certain utopian vision people had for the 20th century right oh wow it's going to be 1900 soon it's going to be 1901 it's going to be the 20th century we're going to be flying in cars soon i don't know if you know about all the fairs that were going on in chicago in particular Tesla's at his fairs, talking about all of his electricity, his wireless technology. People in the 1890s were excited about the 20th century. We're going to go to the moon, all kinds of stuff. And a big part of that millennial fever, if I call it that, where everybody was excited about the new century, it was a very utopian moment where 
to say and like let's let's all be friends in a way and so this world parliament of religions is kind of really awesome again it's one of the first moments in history that's such a broad group diverse group of nationalities and religions have ever gotten together and there's going to be two people from this world parliament i'm going to mention real quick one is this guy angarika dharmapala so he came from Ceylon, he came from Sri Lanka to the World Parliament of Religion in 1893, and he conducted a, a ordination ceremony for this guy, Charles Strauss, um, a New York businessman, our first Jubu, right? This term Jubu, right, a, a, of Jewish descent, became the first person to formally convert to Buddhism on American soil, right? Because the madam and the colonel were already over in Sri Lanka doing it, but this was the first time it happened in America. Um, Angarika Dharmapala also officiated the first Buddha's birthday, the Vasak, um, in San Francisco in May 1897. So there's our San Francisco connection. What's interesting about uh, Angarika Dharmapala is that he was a missionary he was at the World Parliament of Religions. He's going to India. He's rebuild, rebuilding the stupa at Bodh Gaya. He's over here. He's in, in London telling the Londoners about Buddhism. So he's like an interesting, modern, again, 20th century Buddhist in that way, or late 19th century. While I'm talking about him, this, the, that Southeast Asian Theravada tradition, I need to mention Ajahn Chah. This is a Thai Buddhist monk, so not Sri Lanka, but Thai. Ajahn Chah is considered sort of the granddaddy of this Thai forest tradition. And I could kind of talk about Ajahn Chah all night, but I just mentioned him so that I may mention Jack Cornfield. He is ordained by Ajahn Chah in around 1967. And Jack Cornfield then brings that Thai forest tradition to the United States. And he creates the Insight Meditation Society in 1975. This is a lay, lay Buddhist organization. So even though Jack Cornfield is ordained, he brings to America a lay type of Buddhism. He starts Spirit Rock, that's in uh, Woodacre, right? North of San Francisco, that's with Sharon Salzberg, also a famous Dharma teacher these days. Joseph Goldstein, also famous Dharma teacher these days. And Jack Cornfield and that crew, Sharon Salzberg and those, they are sort of credited with founding this modern mindfulness tradition. The modern mindfulness tradition is based in the Theravadan tradition, which goes back to Ajahn Chah. So even though it's a lay Buddhist tradition, non-monastic, um, uh, dharmically or Buddhologically, it's aligned with that more Theravadan Thai tradition. Let's go back though real quick to the World Parliament of Religions because I wanna point out these two characters. Uh, these are two Japanese Buddhist monks that also came to the World Parliament of Religions. But it's not them that I actually wanna talk about. It's somebody who is not pictured. The person not pictured is their translator. So these two Japanese Buddhist monks, they had a young Japanese translator. Here is a picture of him, not so young anymore. This is D.T. Suzuki. So D.T. Suzuki was like very, very young, um, what, 20? whatever, at the World Parliament of Religions. And so at that time, he was just a student translator, but he would eventually become a great scholar, author, and translator of Buddhist texts. And so he wrote extensively about Buddhism, not just like translating it, but what it is. And so he, he writes there, you see, between 1927 and 1935. So before the war, before World War II. And so if you remember from that quote I read from the Dharma Bums about Gary Snyder's library, that he had this full collection of DT Suzuki books, right? 
So this is just sort of starting to bring us full circle back around to my original curiosity, which was how did the beats get into Buddhism? Like, what were they reading? Well, they were reading DT Suzuki, who was a translator for these first Japanese emissaries or Japanese Buddhist emissaries to the World Parliament of Religion, right? Um, really quick while we're talking about, because DT Suzuki, while he was a Buddhist, He's sort of more known as a scholar. He taught, I believe he taught at Columbia. He's very associated with Columbia University. So is Ruth Fuller Sasaki. She's a scholar, but also a practitioner. And so these two are really, should be given a lot of credit for the, you know, academic study of Buddhism, bringing us good, proper scholarly translations, but they were also practitioners in that way. As we now wind back around to our Dharma bums, this is again, Gary Snyder. Again, those are his orange crates filled with his DT Suzuki books, right? There's another Dharma bum that's written about in Kerouac's book, Friends with um, Gary Snyder, and that's this guy, Alan Watts. He does appear as a character in the Dharma bums, big, connection to San Francisco. He worked at KPFA at Berkeley. My first book of Buddhism was his, The Way of Zen. That kind of got me into it. So this is a real personal connection is Alan Watts. He kind of turned me on to Buddhism in that way, uh, along with Kerouac. Uh, and he lived in Sausalito on the dock of the bay um, and also at a cabin at Mount Tamalpais, where I believe Kerouac wrote his Desolation Angels he definitely wrote Desolation Angels at, on Mount Tamalpais, but if it was in um, Alan Watts's cabin, I'm not sure. I mentioned those guys, Gary Snyder again and Alan Watts, because those two guys were deeply connected to the San Francisco Zen Center. Um, Ginsburg too was a, a big, he would go to the San Francisco Zen Center a lot. And so talking again about San Francisco as this hub, of Buddhism in America. This is Shunru Suzuki, the founder of the San Francisco Zen Center, founded in 1959. Um, so this guy definitely should be given a, you know, a tremendous amount of credit for bringing Buddhism to America. But in particular, in the context of this talk, because it was at the San Francisco Zen Center that Allen Ginsberg, Gary Snyder, Alan Watts, and these guys, that they had a place to go to learn about meditation, to learn about Buddhism. So interesting, again, connection there. Uh, that's the San Francisco Zen Center, currently at 300 Page Street, but they are also associated with the Bay Area, uh, the Green Gulch in Muir Beach, and Tassajara. Um, those are their retreat centers. Um, and I put this all up there just because I know a lot of uh, San Francisco people might, you might know of these places, but not know that they're necessarily connected or know that they go back to the beat generation, right? It, it couldn't be an MC Owens talk if I didn't mention Thich Nhat Hanh. He's, he's not really particularly in any way associated with the beats, but he's definitely deeply, um, you know, has a lot to do with Buddhism in America. He's a Vietnamese. Zen Buddhist monk. He's kind of, um, you know, credited with, credited with founding this uh, movement of engaged Buddhism. I did a talk recently for the San Francisco Dharma Collective about engaged Buddhism, in particular Thich Nhat Hanh's type of Buddhism, if you're interested in that. He started his own type of Buddhism in 1966, um, this nonprofit, the Order of Interbeing, and he has his own monastic tradition called the Plum Village tradition, of which there is a retreat center down in Southern California in Escondido. Not quite Northern Bay Area, but we're still in California. So, uh, and also of course the Plum Village in France, which is the main, uh, the main center for Thich Nhat Hanh's tradition. And one last character, this is Chungya Trumpa Rinpoche. Um, I got to mention him because he's the founder of the Shambhala tradition and Shambhala is, you know, it's very big in, in today's modern Buddhist, American Buddhist world. Um, 
Chung Chung Yum Chumpa Rinpoche. Rinpoche means teacher, so Rinpoche. Um, he holds a few different lineages, as you see here. He's credited with bringing the tantric Vajrayana tradition to America in the 70s, or at least 1970. He wrote the famous book, Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. It's how a, a lot of people got into Buddhism. Um, I probably would have got into Buddhism through that book, but I didn't get to it till a little bit later. Um, and he's also the founder of Naropa, which is a famous Buddhist university um, in Boulder, Colorado. That started in 1974 with teachers like Dharma Bum, Allen Ginsberg, and famous Dharma teacher uh, Ram Das as well, who recently passed away. So I mention him because of his connection to Ginsberg. So, oh, and here's a picture, Allen Ginsberg and Chung Yan Trumpa Rinpoche. And my joke is that this is a picture of the world's first podcast, right? Um, that's a joke. Um, but so just to show you that the, Tibet, the Tibetan style of Buddhism that uh, Trungpa Rinpoche represented that Allen Ginsberg got into was this kind of more looser tantric type of Buddhism. So um, just wanted you to know that that connection existed. And so just to conclude this talk really quickly, these are sort of four representatives that I focused on, Jack Kerouac, Alan, uh, Jack Kerouac, Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg, and Jack Kornfield. And yeah, this again, this talk has sort of been centered around the beats, but it's sort of been more about how Buddhism got to America and these early Americans that were interested in Buddhism. And so these four really kind of, Kerouac, Snyder, Ginsberg, and Kornfield, they really kind of represent those four types of Buddhism that I showed you were basically surviving come the 19th century, the four types of Buddhism that made it to America, the kind of more broad, just sutra-based, good old Mahayana, save all sentient beings kind of Buddhism. That's Kerouac's kind of Buddhism versus, you know, Gary Snyder, he, in the Dharma Bums, in the book, The Dharma Bums, Jaffe Ryder, Gary Snyder, he's about to go to Japan. And he does, Gary Snyder, at that time that uh, he met Kerouac, he goes to Japan and he ordains in the Zen tradition, Japanese Zen tradition, comes back and becomes a proponent of that specific kind of Japanese, very austere, rigid type of Zen Buddhism. Like I said, Allen Ginsberg, more of the, the kind of protest movement, the more socially kind of radical movement of the 60s, he gravitated more towards the Tibetan tantric uh, uh, Buddhism of the Shambhala tradition. And then finally, Jack Kornfield bringing us that old school Pali-based Theravada tradition. And indeed, in today's Buddhist world in America, these are more or less the four types of Buddhism that you will find. And just to put an end to this last talk, it's, our, it's debatable. In fact, maybe this is a great little transition to begin to open it up for questions. It's debatable whether there is such a thing as American Buddhism. It's debatable. You, you'd have to explain to me how you're defining those things, of course. But there's a lot of debate about, you know, are, are we in America still just practicing Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, Southeast Asian Buddhism, or Tibetan Buddhism on American soil? And if, if indeed, you know, if you're going to go um, get lineaged, if you're going to go get a... Um, you know, you're going to get an empowerment and you're going to get an Abhisheka and you're going to get um, lineaged into the Shambhala tradition, you're in a Tibetan tradition. And if you get ordained in the Theravada tradition, you're ordained in a Southeast Asian tradition. If you're a Rinzai or a 
Sotsuro or Obaku Zen, you're in the Japanese tradition. And if you sign up with, you know, a number of the Chinese, Taiwanese, Korean based Mahayana traditions, you're going to be chanting in Chinese or Korean and you're going to be in a Chinese or Korean tradition. If you define an American Buddhist tradition by a, a uh, renunciatory path, a monastic path, I don't think there is one yet. There might be. I have yet to see it. But if you're just judging it by a sangha, just a group of lay practitioners, well, that goes back to uh, Santa Barbara, right? It goes back to way back to our um, Goddard our Goddard Bible back in the early, um, you know, even uh, 19th century. So whether there's an American Buddhism or not, I leave that up to you to decide, but I want to appreciate everybody's uh, great attention for sitting through my Dharma Bums, Buddhism and the Beats, a history of Buddhism in America, not the history of Buddhism in America. So I'll leave you with that. I'm gonna switch over here so that we might see each other or so that I might see you. Hi, everybody. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so that was just um, just a little bit over what I had planned, but I hope that wasn't too much too fast. Welcome, welcome. If anybody has any comments, ideas, or questions, answers? Nothing? Let's, if there's no, if somebody's got to give me some kind of prompt to that. I'm, Henrik. Uh, how, how about modernism and, you know, the so-called, uh, um, uh, you know, like the Western influence on Buddhism uh, in the late 18th century. Yeah, where do you want to start, really? Um, yeah, where where do you want to start? There. Um, how doing... about Protestant? Like, what, how about Protestant Buddhism? Uh, Protestant Buddhism. Right. Yeah, yeah, and you know what's re what's really interesting just about that comment is, you know, I think we saw it with Goddard himself. He was a Christian missionary. A lot of the early Buddhists were Protestant. They were kind of Christian. And it's interesting, actually, that a lot of them didn't see any problem with being a Christian and a Buddhist, at least in those early days. That eventually becomes a problem. Um, I did mention the, the, uh, the Jubu remark, but just that kind of movement of Jewish Buddhism that is sort of very, I don't want to say it's popular because it, it's not a thing. It's just um, a thing that we see happening a lot, with a, which is a, a happy marriage between Buddhism and Judaism in that way. Your first comment, Henrik, on like this, um, well, about American Buddhism, you know, on that, on that comment, this talk has, has evolved a lot. And there are, there are funny uh, traces of earlier versions of it. <laughs> and I used to emphasize a lot more something that's now just kind of latent in it, which is everywhere Buddhism goes, that, uh, that culture, whether it's uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, or whether it's China, or whether it's Korea, or whether it's Japan, every place Buddhism goes, it seems to take a few hundred years for people to be like, wait, what? <laughs> what? No self? Empty? Wait, what? And they kind of spent a few hundred years digesting it, figuring out how to translate the ideas into their language, and then they eventually make it their own. And this pattern has just been going on and on over and over. And when I first created this talk, I was much more academic. I was much more academic. And so I was very interested in 
in, in basically Henrik's uh, comment question, which is, I was very interested in like, oh, we got it. We got it about a hundred years ago. We're sort of deep in the like, wait, what? He said, what? And we're digesting it, translating it. And we are in the process of making it our own. And so the older versions of the talk used to spend a little bit more time on pointing out exactly how the Chinese, for example, with their in indigenous philosophies, indigenous values, their unique view of the world, they took Buddhism and they were like, oh, this is perfect. Yeah, that stuff, yeah. Uh, um, uh, uh, cut off all ties with your family? Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> we're not doing that. Uh, you know, all these different things that they're like, yeah, we're not doing that, we're not doing that. Ooh, but we'll do this. So all these different cultures, they get it, they play around with it, they discard what they don't like, and then they make their new thing. We're in the process of doing that for sure. I definitely have felt from the mindfulness movement, the more poly-based, uh, Theravada-based tradition, it's becoming very psychologized, very um, married with psychoanalysis and therapy. It's just kind of a really, really ancient, but really great form of, of uh, analysis and things like that, which it is, <laughs> you know? So I think there's that going on. Um, yeah, I could say a bunch more too, but also the, the Tibetan tradition has a much more, a little more of a, um, you know, the Tibetan thing is a little more Hogwarts. It's a little more magical, a little more enchanting your life with, you know, prayer flags and mantras and sadhanas and this, this kind of more magical things. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that type of Buddhism, the tantric form of Buddhism. Yeah, those are just a few ideas. You know, I probably talk all night, but I'll, I digress. <laughs> Keith down there. Oh, hey, uh, hey, thanks for the, the, the really great talk. Um, My pleasure. Um, I, you know, I too, I got introduced kind of to Buddhism really by reading the Dharma bums. And I read that first, the first time I read that word Bodhisattva, I wanted to know what that was all about. Um, as far as like American Buddhism, I think, you know, like you said, is Buddhism kind of has gotten into these cultures and it's, always been a great blending with other things that are there like Kerouac himself you know he really blended his Catholicism with the devotional part of it good point you know very good point but I, I think you know I, I've also have been really into the you know I came up sort of in the really got into my Buddhism through the Dharma punk movement yep uh which is sort of the engaged anti-consumerism, anti-materialism, punk rock ethos. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of, you know, there's this great thing of, you know, this, this lay tradition is really holding more in the United States, like you said. And then along with like the, uh, Dr. Danzinger and Rick Hansen, who are really incorporating the science behind things. Yep. Um, and you know you're probably right I don't I don't think we we have our own full tradition yet I think we're probably a couple decades or a century away from it being true American Buddhism yep yep thanks for those comments Keith yeah and definitely on on um, Kerouac's you know he was a lifetime Catholic in that way he kind of went back and forth back and forth and I think it's a good point that he he had a kind of devotional side to him. And so the, his Buddhism was very devotional. He had, you know, mala beads. He did the prayers. He was very kind of devotional, but also totally uh, disestablishmentarian, right? He was totally anti the, uh, any church or anything. So he, he's going to go to the railroad yard and then do his prayers and recite his mantras. So. <laughs> Uh, Tanya, I think Tanya had her hand up a minute ago, and then Eric, unless yeah, you... oh. yeah, I was 
just thinking like how do Buddhists outside of the United States view how we're sort of doing Buddhism here? That's a great question. There's another um, version of this talk that I took, I take a, a, a bigger digression to talk about a very important book that came out in the 1890s called The Light of Asia. The Light of Asia by Sir Edwin Arnold is a, Sir Edward, Sir, right, right away, you're like, oh wow. Sir Edward, Sir Edwin Arnold is a British dude who wrote his own version of the life story of the Buddha. And he called his, his poem, The Light of Asia. And it's a weird kind of like, talk about Protestant Buddhism, but it's a weird, just, you know, retelling of the story of Siddhartha as I would have liked it to have gone down in a way. It's, it's not very far from traditional legend in that way. The reason why I mention it and the reason why I used to mention it is because um, Gandhi, the, the Mahatma Gandhi, he famously learned about Buddhism, his sort of indigenous religion, being an Indian person, but he learned about it from the light of Asia, from Sir Edwin Arnold's light of Asia, a British dude first. And then he went, then he went to India and, you know, he of course learned actual Hinduism and Buddhism and all of that. But I mentioned that to, to kind of make a comment for, for Tanya's question, which is that there's a lot of this going on today where the American type of Buddhism is being exported back to Sri Lanka, back to Thailand, back to China, back to Japan. And they're kind of practicing, or at least I have seen them practicing a more mindfulness for productivity, you know, type of Buddhism. <laughs> it's like, wait, that's the American kind. So there's a little bit of that going on. Um, in general, though, I think, Tanya, it's a great question, which is, yeah, how do they view view us, I would actually even complicate, I, I'll complicate my answer a little bit by this. You know, it's a funny thing about census, you know, we're in the middle of doing a, uh, the great 2020 census of America, right? It's a funny thing about cens census, census, that's plural, right? There's a funny thing about census that it's like if you go to East Asia and you ask people if they're Buddhist, they may or may not say yes, even though they go to Buddhist temples and pray and burn incense when their mother's sick or something like that. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, but I'm not a Buddhist. But, you know, mom's sick. <laughs> I got to go do what I got to do. And to us, we'd be like, but you're Buddhist then. If you go to the Buddhist temple and pray to the Buddha, you're Buddhist. And they would be like, no, but I don't have a shaved head. I don't have... I don't do all that. I'm not a Buddhist. At the same time, people might look at us and be like, you're not, you're not Buddhist. And you're like, no, I'm Buddhist. I took vows. I go to my, I go to the SFDC and da, da, da. And they'll be like, oh, well, and where I'm from, a Buddhist doesn't look like that. <laughs> and so even the very way that we would define what a Buddhist is, that is complicated. It just that's complicated, let alone the actual like ideas of who's doing Buddhism, who's not, <laughs> and all that. Can I just make one comment real quick? Like, you, you know, you said the thing about like it getting exported mindfulness and productivity. You know, there's there's a way that Buddhism, I think, and mindfulness can be co-opted from the capitalist point of view. And, and this sometimes, you know, people who don't really go deep, maybe in terms of like just being mindful so that they can be more productive and you know, and, and that's, that would be, I, I mean, I, I think that sometimes happens here. And, and oh. it's unfortunate that people don't go farther because, you know, and that it's not just a way of making people more productive in our capitalist society. Absolutely, Tanya. But you know what? They might go further. And then we in the Dharma game, we call that upaya, right? Ah. And that's where, that's where Buddhism always gets them, though. They always think they're going to co-opt Buddhism, but you can't do it. So. <laughs> So, <laughs> anyways, Eric, you you had a question. 
Yeah, I actually kind of oddly enough jumping or, off with Tanya, uh, what kind of what Tanya was talking about, looking at um, was wondering your thoughts on specifically when you talk about Cornfield and Salzburg and that group uh, transitioning Buddhism into mindfulness movement. Mm. Um, and also looking specifically at the uh, transformation by John Kabat-Zinn of Buddhism, uh, Buddhist meditation into MBSR mm -hmm. and how that's really impacting. And to some extent, I wonder if you almost consider undercutting a possible Buddhist tradition in the United States or in the West, because now we've taken two of <laughs> two paths of the eightfold path and we're we're <laughs> fixating on this this real narrow path and as someone who's uh, assumed to be a psychological practitioner a, a clinician you know so many colleagues that i work with look at mindfulness as like this weekend seminar mm. it's like no 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 that's not how this works um and so a lot of the interaction that i have is this really diluted concept of mindfulness and meditation and not understanding the vast importance of the other six paths to really shore up. So I'm curious, like what your thoughts are, like, is there a possible dilution or negative impact of the mindfulness movement into the development of a Western tradition? Mm. Why? Well, yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great uh, question comment. Um, I kind of have two things to say about it. One is sort of just on the heels of what I said to Tanya in that way. Um, but my, the other point though is, is I think a little more interesting. And, you know, the, you know, it's tricky. It's interesting because the, th uh, this is really tricky because I have a lot to say about this. So I need to be careful, but it's in fact so the tricky part about that that whole movement the mindfulness movement is that it is sort of based on and comes out of this theravada tradition it comes out of the the pali based tradition the pali abhidharma tradition it comes out of pali uh, commentary tradition I'm talking about the Vasudhi Magga, the path of purification. A lot of people refer to that. But the problem is, is that Theravada Buddhism, in particular, the Vasudhi Magga and all of that, that's for monastics. That whole tradition is for renunciants and not just like good old bodhisattva renunciants. I'm talking about the real renunciants, the no sex, <laughs> no property, no, no. So... It's interesting to me that that tradition is based on a monastic one and they're trying to not encourage the monasticism or something, but they're, we're not going to talk about that, but we're going to still do the, the whole philosophy, Buddhology and all of that, of that tradition. That I feel like, and this is just me, Michael, talking personally, and I'm not accusing anybody of anything. Because again, my answer is the one I gave to Tanya. It's all upaya. It's all going to work. It, it gets people into it. Then they realize it's diluted or diluted. And then they, they get the real stuff. It's how it has always worked. So we're not worried about that. That's fine. What I'm a little worried about, though, when it comes to that transition out of the monasticism and into the lay mindfulness movement, but where you still have the, the DNA, so to speak, of a monastic tradition, you run the risk. Again, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but you run the risk of a little bit of like Catholic psychosis where they're telling me this thing is bad, really bad, the worst thing ever, but don't worry about it, it's okay. But it's terrible. And it's, it's like, well, that's a really psychotic message because if you're ready to be a renunciant and shave your head and wear the same clothes and for the rest of your life and not have sex, we've got a message for you. <laughs> but to give that message to people that are not really doing that, again, it, it, it's a possibility. <laughs> it's a possibility. So... <laughs>
that's my con comment on on modern mindfulness without trying to get myself into too much trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Uh, maybe one more. Four, I mean, four minutes is a lifetime, frankly. So, um, uh, so you so great to see you all. Really, <laughs> I have a question. Yeah, yeah, Allison, shoot. Um, in the quote from Dharma Bums, uh, towards the beginning of the presentation, he triangulated the circuit as um, New York City, Mexico City, and San Francisco and seem to indicate a lot of like cultural sharing between them. And so I'm curious whether there's a relationship in terms of like the history of spread of Buddhism in the North American continent, continent oh. between those three cities. Wow. Um, I certainly don't know much about South American Buddhism. I will tell you that if there's one thing I don't know anything about actually is South American Buddhism. So I don't know about that. I will say from somebody who really aligns themselves with Kerouac in that way that I really, I'm a, I'm a sutra based Buddhist, very Mahayana, save all sentient beings kind of Buddhist. I, I sort of lament that Kerouac's Buddhism didn't, isn't as popular and didn't survive. What I kind of consider the more, you know, the little more um, bohemian artistic, type of Buddhism, exploratory, like that one didn't, and mainly because it's not a lineage, it, there's no way to measure it. It's kind of a little more Buddhist that way where it's like amorphous. Um, so that one didn't really stick. And these more traditional lineages that Gary Snyder and Allen Ginsberg aligned with, they you know flourished. And so I don't think Kerouac had much influence in terms of his Buddhism in his grand circuit in that way. In fact, I don't even think he had that much influence in North America on Buddhism in that way. Because again, Gary Snyder, who brings an old lineage and, you know, Allen Ginsberg, who attaches to an old lineage and, you know, this, this kind of desire to have the oldest or attach the oldest, you know. But, so that's a good, interesting question though. Thanks. My pleasure. And on that note, I think I'm going to call it a night. Uh, I want to thank you all so much for being here. This has been so much fun. Um, so great. Thank you.